Yeah, good to be with y'all uh, virtually across the world here. And uh, I'm such a big fan of Speak and uh, of, of uh, all the great things you've done to creatively uh, expose injustice and amplify the cries of the oppressed. And uh, this is a time to shine, I would say, when it can feel like uh, there's a, a, lot, a lot of... Uh, uh, darkness and hatred and things in the air it's a beautiful time to uh, be the people of God and leave off the fragrance of Jesus um, I like how Stanley Hauer was uh, you know he's a great theologian he said uh, that Christians are meant to be the air fresheners of the world in the toilet of the world <laughs> and I think sometimes we've smelled more like the poop than the air freshener but uh, it's great to uh, think about what it means right now I think to uh, um, shine God's love and there's a there's a scripture that I wanted to open us up with um, I think it's one of the the those you know sometimes you read these words of Jesus and it's amazing how uh, relevant they are to the world that we live in right now I mean they, they could have been written yesterday um, and so this is a story that it may be familiar to some of us. And, and if you've heard, you know, if you kind of grew up in the church and kind of shake it off and listen with fruit, with, with uh, uh, fresh ears. And, and for others of you, if um, you really haven't been a part of the church or read much of the Bible, um, it's a beautiful story that Jesus uh, told uh, in Luke um, 16. And it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So I'll read it for us. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and they licked his sores. Well, the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, and the rich man also died, and he was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. Well, I, I know it's, I mean, it's a pretty heavy text, you know, well, uh, kind of uh, messes with the, the vibe in the room. But I, I love how one pastor said, you know you've really heard the truth when it comforts the disturbed and it disturbs the comfortable. And I think this is one of those verses that is beautiful for the, such a time as this because um, the, the early Christians pointed out a few things that are, I think, so important for today. One of them is that as you listen to the story, one thing that stands out is that the rich man doesn't have a name and the poor man does. And the early Christians said there's something to that we should pay attention to. Because in this, in this world, we know the names of the rich folks. We've got corporations named after them. We've got streets and monuments named after them. And uh, bricks and pews sometimes that have their names on them. And yet, uh, a lot of us don't know the names of the poor folks that, that are dying without anybody holding their hand. And in the shadows and margins of our world. But God knows their names. And we are invited to move closer to their suffering and move our lives closer to the fringes and the margins. And uh, uh, Lazarus actually means the one God heard and rescued. That's what his name means. And he's the only character in the parables of Jesus that, who is given a name. And, uh, you know, usually it's like the farmer, the king, the widow. And yet in this story... Uh, Lazarus has a name and, and there's, there's also another thing that uh, the early Christians said that as you look at the rich man and his language it appears that he was religious 
because he says, Father Abraham. He identifies with the family of God. He knows the prophets. He knows the story. And yet, what's disturbing is that his religion did nothing to move him in compassion and justice for the person who was just on the other side of his gated neighborhood and his fortified wall. And, you know, you look at that and you think, here's a man who, like much of our world, like many of us, has built his life around insulating himself from suffering and creating layers that separate him and protect him from the pain of, of the uh, of others, of, of the young, of the man on the other side. Um, so if we want to think about walls, we want to think about gates and picket fences and wa- uh, office cubicles and all the things that ser- separate us from other people. I think we, we, we sometimes think that we are um, keeping ourselves safe, but I think living a life in a gated world is one of the most dangerous places we can be because we, we're made for compassion, we're made for love, and we come to find out, like the rich man did, that when we build these walls, not only do they separate us from the poor, but they separate us from God. And that's why in some of the richest corners of the world, we have the highest rates of loneliness, depression, suicide, self-medication, addiction to prescription drugs, like in in some of the wealthiest places in the world. So the walls aren't good for anybody. They weren't good for the poor man and they weren't good for the rich man either. It was C.S. Lewis that once said that uh, uh, hell can be locked from the inside that we actually can lock ourselves in. We, we lock God out. We lock people out. We, we uh, lock ourselves out from, from uh, the possibilities of compassion. And, you know, as I think about some of that uh, and, the, and, and the relevance that it has to the world that we live in, I, I think one of the things that strikes me is that the, um, the rich man wasn't called to uh, solve all the world's problems. I mean, he, he was called to build a relationship with someone who was suffering. Mother Teresa had a beautiful line. She said, um, we, we can talk a lot. It can, it can become very fashionable to talk about the poor and still not know the poor. Um, we, we can talk about justice and sometimes still not know the victims of injustice. And so I think one of the invitations of this story is not just to fall in love with a cause or a campaign, but to fall in love with real people. And, and when we think about the, the um, crisis of immigrants and refugees, and um, uh, it's, it's an invitation to lean in and to get to know people who are suffering. Um, I, I worked, as some of you may know, I worked at a, a very wealthy, prominent megachurch uh, outside Chicago for a little while. I spent a year there at Willow Creek. And while I was there, one of the things I began to realize that is that in the, in the world, and, and I think especially in the church, what's true sometimes is that we don't have a compassion problem, we have a relationship problem. And it's, it's not that... Uh, Wealthy folks don't care about poor folks, but often that they don't know poor folks. And, and if they knew, it actually might keep them up at night. And so we create these, you know, layers of kind of protecting ourselves. And I, I did a survey while I was um, out at Willow, and it, and it extended beyond Willow Creek. So this wasn't just Willow Creek, but it was endemic in, in kind of the evangelical church. I, I asked people who self-identified as strong Christians. I said, did Jesus spend time with the poor? And oh, like 95% of them, almost all of them said, yes, Jesus spent tons of time with the poor. Well, later in that that questionnaire, I asked them, and again, these are strong Christians as they they, they self-identified. And I said, do you spend time with the poor? And it was less than 5%, the exact opposite. Like very, very few of them said, yes, I spend time with folks who are poor or I have meaningful relationships with folks who are economically struggling. And, and, and so I, I, you know, as I read that, I thought that that's been true in my own life too, is that we can live in kind of these silos and, and uh, spaces where we uh, don't encounter folks who are suffering. But the invitation of Jesus and the invitation of this text, I think, is to get out, you know, to get outside the walls and to open our homes, our lives uh, to others. It's a call to hospitality. What's happening right now in our world, I think in in the UK um, and in the United States especially, 
um, as we see people fortifying their gated worlds. Um, when we think about this text, we, we now have like a hundred people, a hundred of our richest people in the world own the same amount as half the world. Um, you know, it, it boggles the mind that, it, I mean, one statistic I, I saw said it, it's now almost 50 people that own the, the same amount as 3.5 billion people. Uh, so the disparities between the rich and the poor, when uh, in the United States, the average CEO is making 400 times the average worker. Uh, so the, the average worker has to work an entire month to make what the CEO makes in one hour. I mean, these, this is messed up, right? We look at those statistics, and yet I think some of that doesn't change until our relationships change and until we can amplify the folks who are at the bottom uh, to the point that those who are at the top can't help but be, uh, but be moved by, by the suffering they've created. And you, you think of the verse in, in the book of James. It says, the cries of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Uh, and and, and we, 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 we've got to continue to amplify those voices. A, a few places that we've seen that happen in the United States, um, especially around immigration, has been pretty amazing. We've got a whole movement in Philadelphia called the New Sanctuary Movement. And it's a solidarity movement um, to resist deportations of, uh, and the ripping apart of families here. So what that's, what that's turning into is pretty incredible, and it might um, uh, be helpful for you to know some, some of what that looks like here. So our city uh, of just over a million people um, has, is one of the, the many sanctuary cities in the United States that um, has said we will not comply with deportations. And our, our whole council, our city council voted uh, to not deport people or not comply to these deportations. Our mayor said Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. And anybody is welcome here, uh, no matter who you are or where you come from. And so now what is happening is almost every weekend there are trainings of clergy and activists like folks uh, just like you at Speak that are doing nonviolent solidarity trainings. And when a deportation happens, there is an alert that goes out. We have what we call Amber Alerts. I don't know if you have those, but that's when like a, a child is missing and it goes out everywhere. Um, well, we're creating, uh, my friends are creating uh, a similar a sanctuary alert. So if someone's uh, safety or family is endangered by deportations, an alert goes out and the folks that have been trained to uh, in nonviolent direct action are able to gather around that family um, nonviolently and, and stand in solidarity and, and maybe even eventually um, to actually create a circle of protection around them. Um, so it's amazing, and it's amazing that our city government is on board. Of course, now you, you've probably seen some of the federal government is threatening to defund states or, or, or sanctuary cities. So there's all that in play. But what's amazing is it's all about the names and the people and the stories. And, and it's the relationships that are uh, magnetically spreading that uh, in a contagious way. Uh, so now we see other cities that are, are having, you know, have beautiful movement, movements of sanctuary as well. One of the ones I really loved, I got to visit along the border of the U.S. and Mexico was spectacular because they had said, you know, in addition to all the sanctuary solidarity and the legal help that we can give, we need to be a prophetic witness, you know, because Martin Luther King said the church is not meant to be the servant or the master of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience of the state. The church is meant to wake people up, you know, to stir people, to move folks to to act in love and compassion. And so they organized... Um, a, a communion service along the wall and they invited folks in on the Mexico side to meet on their side of the wall and folks on the US side met them there and they worshiped uh, in Spanish and English you know in solidarity with one another over uh, through the wall and then um, they uh, said you know one week the spirit really moved and we wanted to uh, serve each other communion so we took the bread and we threw it, you know, up over the wall and we served each other communion. 
And I look at that and I think that's exactly what it means to be the people of God. That, to, as Jesus said, what's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. That now our love is not confined by biology or to our nuclear family. It's not limited to our national family or our, our uh, borders. Uh, you know, our love doesn't stop at borders. And one of the things that we like to say is a love for our own people is a good thing. But why should love stop at borders? Our love is borderless. Our uh, love, no wall, no, no matter how big or how fortified it is, can stop love. And I, you know, I've learned that so many different places when I, I've been over with um, our friends in Palestine and uh, uh, Israel and in the West Bank. Uh, there's so many stories of folks that are uh, doing work to try to tear down um, the wall there between Israel and Palestine, what has been called the most sophisticated apartheid system in history. And, you know, you're probably familiar with some of these images of, uh, you know, I, I brought you a couple just I don't know if you can see. But, um, the you know, these famous Banksy uh, uh, images on the uh, of the wall and the possibility of seeing through it. And I think each of these, you know, uh, art uh, pieces are are invitations to kind of um, transcend the walls. This is one of my favorites right here. Booyah. Take that, Donald Trump, right? But anyway, you know that that's uh, that's like I think what we what we 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 believe and what we we do, um, and it starts small. You know, I, I think some of the things that have been so powerful in our country um, have started with one uh, family or relationship that has exposed the injustice, and then that begins to spread. Um, and uh, even even just recently, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of work around the death penalty. And, um, I, you know, we can talk more about that if you want. But I know it's it's kind of a U.S. thing. You guys are civilized over there. You've moved beyond it, you know. But uh, but even this week in Arkansas, there were a, a string of executions. Um, uh, they were trying to execute eight people in 10 days. And there was massive resistance against it. But one of the most powerful things that happened is one of the victims' families, the murder victims' families, said no to the execution and said, honor our loved ones, but not with more killing. Uh, you know, to honor the victims without creating a whole new set of victims and extending the trauma and exacerbating the wounds of this. And they actually, this is the murder victims' family, um, flew the family of the person who was to be executed out so they could have a last visit with their father and they did visit Kenneth Williams and uh, my understanding is also that his last meal you know we have this kind of sick ritual as we execute people that they get a last meal and sometimes it's like steak or fried chicken or whatever but uh, Mr. Williams asked for Holy Communion uh, for communion to be his last meal and then the murder victim's family and the family of, of, the, the, of, of Mr. Williams held hands together and they told a bell um, as his life was taken by the state of Arkansas. And it was horrific. But I think what happened in the darkness was the, the, the light of their love and their compassion for one another um, sort of stole the show. It, 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 it went deeper than all of the... the uh, drama of state killing, and it said we Arkansas is on the wrong side of history, and we're going to look back at the death penalty like we look back at slavery with horror and with shame. But what I also learned from that was like the, and I've been learning this over and over, is the power of when we have subversive friendships, right? When we when when our relationships transcend and don't compute with the narrative of isolation. And um, uh, uh, one, of, one of the things that's happened in Philadelphia, you know, we've had this out, outpouring of, of hate crimes all over our country. Um, and I, I know some of the ones just in our city alone. In Philadelphia, um, you, you, you may or may not have seen this in the news, there was, there was uh, a Jewish cemetery that was defaced and the, the graves were um, vandalized, the um, tombstones. And um, in the middle of that, 
uh, the Muslim community came together, not just in Philly, but all over the country, to raise tens of thousands of dollars to repair the Jewish tombstones and cemeteries. And it moved so many people. Um, and then there was, uh, there was another event in Philadelphia where uh, a, a really sick and um, perverted person took uh, the head of a pig and they dumped it in front of the mosque, one of the mosques in Philadelphia. And people were, were, were horrified by that. But what also happened is that Jewish and Christian uh, clergy and leaders came together to vigil outside of the mosque as Muslims went to prayer. And those acts, I think, also have a way of disarming hearts and, and also of spreading a solidarity that when we stay in our silos and cubicle, like, like kind of our, our uh, own little tribes, uh, they, they have so much power. One other place that we've seen that is in the movement um, uh, against gun violence here in Philadelphia. Um, and, and one of our best allies has become hunters against gun violence. So, so these are gun owners that own guns for uh, hunting or for you know, keeping coyotes off their farm and things like that. But that doesn't equal you know, AK-47s on the streets of Philadelphia or limitless handguns you know, that one person can buy and things like that. So that, that kind of unlikely friendship has been powerful. And, and, and as I, you know, as we kind of survey the landscape of what's happening in the world right now, I think one of the walls we've got to reach across are the walls of politics and theology and, and to kind of build a new common ground, a, a new foundation of love uh, where we can say, you know, we may not have everything in common, but in fact, when we have 20 percent of what we believe in common, when we build on that, it has so much power. In fact, it can have more power than just kind of staying with our with within our our, our own little tribes. I think we when we when we build bridges with folks who uh, disagree with us on some things, but we can really work together on something else. Um, it's an amazing thing. So, um, yeah, finally, I mean, finally, I, I, I guess I I just want to say that I'm I'm so grateful for all the work that you're doing over there and. Um, uh, Luis keeps me in, in the loop, you know, and we're, we're doing the same thing here. We're, um, we've been really inspired by the hope of, um, of, uh, that beautiful verse, uh, God's people will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. And, uh, some of you know, uh, we've been doing that over here. I think, hold on, let me, I'm going to grab you a plow made out of guns. This is one of our, our plows that we made. We've made a whole bunch of them. Um, we've got like 290 million guns, <laughs> just so you know. You know, like we've got a few extras over here. We got like one gun for almost every person in the United States. Uh, so like this is a, another garden tool that we have. And now our friends have been uh, making these um, – Little, uh, this is made out of a barrel of a gun. Um, uh, they're making jewelry out of it. And so we're trying to, oh, and I got this thing. This is from a, a tear gas container that our brothers and sisters in, uh, on the West Bank, you know, they get these tear gas canisters shot at them all the time. So they've been gathering them up. And this is from Bethlehem. So they've been making Christmas ornaments out of tear gas canisters. And so I think that Im imagination is what I've loved about Speak. And it's that imagination of the prophets that says, um, we are going to beat our weapons into, into things that cultivate life and, 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 uh, and, and, and beauty in the world. And so that, that prophetic work, um, it ends, that scripture in Micah and Isaiah ends by saying, nation will not rise up against nation and people will study war no more. But I think what's what's so important about it is it doesn't begin with nations. It doesn't begin with commanders in chief and presidents and prime ministers like peace begins with the people who refuse to kill and who insist on beating their own weapons uh, in, in, into uh, tools that can that can bring life instead of death. And so we are those defiant people, right, that that believe that's the, the trajectory 
of the story of God. It's about redemption. It's about life. It's about interrupting death. And so that causes us to live differently. As, as folks have said, hope changes the one who hopes. Because if we believe that something is coming, we begin to prepare for it. You know, a pregnant mother begins to prepare her home, you know, and paint a room and get things she needs for the child. She eats well and rests and takes care of herself because she knows that a child is being born. And in the pregnancy of the world right now, we know that another world is possible and being born. So we live despite the evidence that we see right now. We and we watch the world begin to change. So it's it's an absolute honor to support the work of Speak. And, and I think we're uh, we're singing the same song across the pond over here. So it's great to be with you. And I, I, I don't want to just talk the whole time. I want to hear what's on your heart. So thanks, Luis. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was really inspirational. Thank you. We love the owls. That's amazing. Um, did we send you a picture that we built the tree for our last peace festival? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen it. Send me another one. That's great. I, I want to see that. Beautiful. All good. Um, yeah, so has anybody got any questions at this day or any sort of comments or any reflections that they have to Hey, Christabel. Uh, Shane, thank you so much for your words. And it was really inspiring. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any... Um, well, I've got two questions. Like what's, what's been on your minds like theologically that's shaping your faith at the moment has there been any new idea or inspiration that you've had that you're really pondering and the second one is what technique or um you know tool have you found to not burn out and not to get overwhelmed by the sadness or the injustice that you see keep going yeah well thanks um I've been, you know, I've, I wrote a book on the death penalty called uh, Executing Grace, and I, I, that's been a lot of my work in, in recent days. And, and a part of that um, is h how we understand why Jesus died. And there's a lot of good theology coming out of the UK there, too. Um, and, um, and, and wonderful voices, Rene Girard, James Allison, and uh, you know, Tom Wright, others that are, are thinking about nonviolent atonement and, and how we understand Jesus' death. But that became really apparent that the, theologically we had to do some work because when it, I mean, the death penalty is, is just kind of a way of putting your finger on the problem um, because uh, the death penalty in America has only succeeded because of Christians. Um, eighty-five percent of executions are in the Bible Belt. So I began to see like we're not going to end this until we um, kind of begin to 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 take on some of the theology that justifies the death penalty. Um, so uh, I've got a a section um, a, of that book uh, for free online because it's the section on Jesus, and I think it's so important. I wanted to make sure that you know. People that don't agree, you know, that are for the death penalty or whatever, don't they're not they're probably not going to buy the book, but maybe they'll read about, um, you know, how we understand the most famous execution in history and think about how worshiping an executed and risen savior might reshape how we think about the death penalty. So I've been doing a lot of work on that. And, you know, there, there's a lot more to be said, but I think what Jesus does is he puts death on display, uh, not to glorify it, but to shame it. You know, and to show us what we're possible, what we're capable of, and then to de defeat that death with love and mercy and forgiveness um, and an empty tomb. And and you know, I I kind of say that that Jesus is is the water poured on the electric chair. You know, he's the uh, to short circuits the whole system and machinery of death. And now, anytime we um, rejoice in death or we support execution and the death penalty we disgrace uh the cross and and the redemptive work of what jesus did so that's been you know a lot of my work now i'll i'll be i'm uh 
this is top secret, but I guess not anymore. Uh, we're we're going to be doing a, a book on gun violence, um, and I'm doing it with my friends who have been transforming the guns. Um, uh, so we, we, we're tentatively calling it beating guns, but we're going to try to look at the, um, the culture of violence that we live in, um, not just in the U S but around the world and, um, what it means to really disarm our hearts and to disarm our streets. Um, and, uh, so, so you can be thinking of that and praying for that. And, and as far as like how I kind of keep moving uh and keep healthy i i there's a few things i I mean i keep a i try to keep a a pretty robust prayer life you know i i we created this resource called common prayer uh uh there's a phone app there's a website uh, a lot of it's free you know uh, but we also have the books that we use and that's been really good for my soul uh it's it's a way that i can pray when i'm home and when i'm traveling um, and it connects like prayer with things going on in the world. So in common prayer, we have like all, uh, prayers for each day, but we also remember things like this is the day that Mandela was released from prison. This is the day that Wilberforce, uh, uh, died or, or Bonhoeffer, or this is, you know, when Rosa Parks stayed on the bus and went to jail and Oscar Romero was killed in El Salvador. So all those things we kind of remember through the year. Um, and that's been good because I kind of feel like sometimes my prayer doesn't quite hit on all cylinders if it's not thinking also about the world that we live in and also pr- bringing our prayers into this world. Um, and I live a really integrated life, too. Like I I like hanging out with kids and then, you know, writing an article and uh, weed in the garden, you know. So I, I think having like um, different things that, that, uh, work different parts of our, uh, brain and body are really good. Um, and likewise, one of the things I think too, is like the macro and micro need to go together for me. Um, and, and by that, I mean, I, I love the fact that we give out food. We share thousands and thousands of pounds of food with people, but we're also asking the question, why are people hungry to begin with? And so I think if we're just responding to needs and crises, it starts to get tiring if we're not doing something about the policies and systems and principalities and powers that hold people down. And so those go together. On the other hand, I know a lot of people in D.C., Washington, D.C., that are you know doing work on the policy and legislative side that they really just need to uh, come uh, play in the, you know, play, play Frisbee in the yard or hang out on the stoop and, and hold someone while they cry. You know, I think that's like, I think those things have to go together. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question. Hello, Shane. Hey. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, I was inspired by your book, uh, Irresistible Revolution many years ago when I was struggling with Jesus, uh, more radical, sayings about a simpler life like sell everything you have and give it to the poor and uh, uh, the son of man has nowhere to lay his, his head and how to sort of apply that in a modern context and I was inspired by sort of how you sort of talked about that and found that in a simple way but I found it more of a struggle to sort of find a community like that here and to live that out with regard to my own stuff it was possibly a, a selfish question but you know I wondered sort of how you kind of continue to live those things out, what sort of words of advice you might have about that, you know, when it's difficult to, to let go. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, well, one, one of the, um, I guess one of the things that I, I've come to feel is really true is that we can't just focus on the material things. I mean, that, I think that's... Um, something that comes as we um, uh, meet and live in proximity to people who are in need is our life begins to kind of minimize a little bit because you realize I don't need all this stuff. Um, But sometimes when we start with the stuff, it just becomes kind of superficial. Um, And, and uh, um, one one of the things that I I, um, say a lot is, once we've discovered, you know, this idea that Jesus talked about loving our neighbor as ourself, 
um, capitalism as we see it won't be possible and Marxism won't be necessary uh, because it's not just a communism that's that's about um, um, d redistributing stuff without love at the center of it, you know. And I, I think love has to really compel us. Um, and and uh, um, uh, like in the early church, they they didn't have community because they shared everything. They shared everything because they had community. You know, they lived with people who were suffering. So I think that becomes a really important starting point. Um, and and um, uh, but we do become more like the people we hang out with. So I think it's really helpful to live among people who are committed to the same countercultural values as as we are. Um, sociologists call that like a plausibility structure. You know, that helps us sustain our values. Uh, especially when they contradict some of the values of the world around us. So, you know, if you want to be more generous, then hang out with generous people. If you want to be more courageous, hang out with courageous people. And I've found that really. And if you want to be more narcissistic, then hang out with narcissists and watch Kardashians a lot, you know. <laughs> but I think that, like, um, uh, has been really true for me because there's a lot of folks that I think live much more radically than I do when it comes to, uh, you know, how simple we can live and things like I've got friends that bike everywhere that don't own cars. You know, I've got friends that eat entirely out of, you know, uh, 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 dumpster diving and things like that. So I think they kind of keep my edge, uh, moving that direction. Um, and, um, um, and the other thing I'd say about community is, it it was so helpful for us to go visit communities that have been around a while. So Franciscan communities and the Bruderhof community, the Catholic workers, you know, all these different communities that have been around. And, and we kind of they, they gave us ingredients that went into creating what we had uh, or what we have. And even the model of community that we have right now is has evolved over uh, 20 years. I think community is kind of like an organism. It's kind of like a baby. You know, it goes through different stages and each one of them, it looks a little different. Each one of them's got their like challenges and they've also got their charm. So I think, I think the life of a community is like that too. So one of the things that we've had to do is kind of hold our community uh, with, with, with um, uh, gentle hands so that it, it can begin to uh, can take different shapes. So we used to all live in one house right across the street from where I am now. And now that no one lives there, it's our hub for everything. And we've got a dozen houses around it, you know, so all of that, like the exact forms have changed, but the spirit is the same. And I think that that becomes important too, is that as we um, go through different phases of our life, the, the, the form of community that we live in may change a little bit, but we still want to have community. We want to have people we share money with, that we share life with. So uh, how do we find that? And and one place to start too, I think, is by visiting some of those folks that have been at it for fifty years, or like some of the Benedictines here. They said we've been doing community for sixteen hundred years, <laughs> so we've learned a few things. You know, if you want to, uh, 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 you know, share share things that we're learning, we would love that. Yeah. Uh, so say, say the question again. I, I couldn't hear part of it. Just say it one more time. Just, um, yeah, just talking about your the Wall Street Jubilee celebration at the Simple Way did a few years ago. I yeah. Was, but I uh, just wondering if you had any words of advice or encouragement about how to sort of do radical or challenging things in public like that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, I mean, that that all came about, I mean, what, what I think is wonderful is that we have more 
what we have more wisdom and um uh imagination collectively than we have on our own so that came about totally from different people's ideas you know just like a lot of the work you've done at speak it is is we kind of you know if someone said well we're gonna you know we'll 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 drop paper money from the top we'll have a bike crew that comes through on bikes and we'll dump change everywhere and so you know like everybody had different roles that they played and um and it was beautiful and it did a lot. We, we disciplined ourselves in nonviolence too, of course, because we knew we don't know the response of the police. We don't know the response. This was after 9-11. So we said, we don't know what we'll be hit with, but we do, we can, we can control, you know, ourselves and how we respond. Um, and, and thankfully, I mean, it was an absolute party on Wall Street, you know, and People were, were, it was contagious. You know, folks came out of Wall Street and said, what's happening outside is more interesting than what's happening on the inside. So they came out, you know, and some of the stockbrokers bought food for folks that were, you know, on the street. And it, it was really a beautiful thing. So I think that that also, it was about, you know, I don't know, that was like 12 or 13 years ago. But that, what we learned from that was the importance of joy and the importance of imagination and humility in the work that we do. Because um, I don't think many people get argued in to justice, but I think they get wooed in. They get uh, uh, fascinated in. They get curious because of different things. So I think we've got to stir the curiosity, you know. And I think we've also, what was also powerful was we literally brought... Um, uh, masses of, of folks who were homeless to the front of the stock exchange. So we put, you know, literally this, this Luke 16 passage, like we brought the rich man and the poor man face to face, you know? Um, and, and that was one of our goals was to show, um, that we're not just holding signs pro protesting something. We're actually like, we actually, um, there are people here who, who have slept on wall street and there are people here who have walked on and, and worked on wall street. And we want to understand what it means to be a family, you know, and to care for each other. And so I think the humanizing of that, we even have police officers that's, you know, I was taken in, I was, I was, it wasn't really an arrest, but I, I guess, you know, I was taken in to custody, handcuffed and everything. But the police officer said, Man, that was that was a lot of fun. If you do that again, you should do it in front of the police station and uh, drop the money outside there. You know, and, but I think they were, you know, they it, they knew that we were, you know, that we were had kind hearts, and I think that made a big difference. Um, uh, we've seen that recently too. I I think one of the the goals, like I said, of Dr. King was to expose injustice so that it becomes so uncomfortable people have to pay attention. And one of the ways that we did that recently, you may have seen, was that um, the Supreme Court around the death penalty on the um, anniversary of our, it was the 40th anniversary of our first modern execution in 1977. Um, so a few, uh, a few weeks ago uh, in January, a couple months ago, we um, had murder victims, family members, and families of the executed together. And that was where the power lied because our message was violence is the problem, not the solution. Honor the victims, but not with more violence, not with more killing. Um, and we, we went onto the steps of the Supreme Court with the names of all the folks who had been executed. So over 1,400 names. Um, and this is just in the last 40 years of our country. Um, but we also carried those who had been killed in our hearts. And so we, we went with two different colored roses. Um, uh, one rose for those who were killed in crimes and the others uh, for those who were killed by our state, our government. And we laid those flowers, hundreds of flowers, on the steps of the Supreme Court um, as we told the bell um, uh, for 40 times for the 40 years of executions. And then we held a banner um, that said, uh, stop executions. And, uh, 18 of us were arrested. Um, and, and we go to trial next month. So you can be praying for us. Um, but we also, it's interesting because our trial falls on the date that the Supreme court temporarily abolished the death penalty or put a moratorium on executions. So it's a really interesting, uh, collision of dates. And we're going to, 
uh, as we've said, we're going to use our trial to put the death penalty on trial. Uh, and in that group of folks who have, uh, were arrested are uh, clergy, Father John Deere, several pastors, um, and uh, families of the executed and murdered Folks, uh, one of my friends who was an exoneree, so he was wrongfully sentenced to death. And I think the power of a lot of these things are when the folks most affected are in the forefront and their voices get amplified. So that's been our, our goal in all of that. Um, and and I, I think that that witness uh, on the steps of the Supreme Court was really effective. We hope to do more uh, direct actions uh, similar to that. We're, we said we're going to keep the resistance up as long as the executions continue. Yeah. Where do we get updates on that? Will you put that on social media? Or... Yeah, I'll put that on social media. Um, we're, we, 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 we wanted to build steam, so we haven't really talked much about the trial, but we'll start ramping it up as soon as we hit May here because it's going to be uh, our trial is June 28th. Um, so, yeah, I'll keep you guys in the loop on all that. And uh, we would love your support. Um, and, and that, like I said, it's less about our trial and more about putting the death penalty on the stand and saying we want, um, you know, this same week that the, the death penalty was temporarily abolished, we would like to see, uh, you know, the death penalty ended once and for all in America. Yeah. That sounds good. And if there's anything we can do, like write a letter, we're sending out like letters and yeah. requests through our phone app as well. And if you've got something, we could do an action card on it or anything around that time. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I mean, one of the things that's going to happen um, for four days, there's going to be people vigiling outside the Supreme Court um, and people telling testimonials of their experience, direct experience with the death penalty as murder victims and, and folks that were wrongfully convicted and things like that. So during that week, it would be awesome if, you know, Speak wanted to do a day of solidarity to fast. Um, because uh, for those four days, many of us will be fasting. Um, and if you're not able to do that, that's fine. But, you know, like some act of solidarity, even for one day or for those four days would be amazing, you know, and just to say, like, we're, we're over here on the other side, you know, praying for with you and standing with you, uh, hoping for an end of the death penalty. And, there, you know, uh, I, I, uh, we, we really appreciate the support because I, I think it, when it when it's put in perspective, it's so helpful that most of the world has moved on from the death penalty. And I think it, it's helpful to have internationals kind of point out this, uh, this absurd idea that we're the, you know, one of the only civilized uh, industrial countries to continue to, to do this uncivilized thing. You know, like we, we, we are in the company of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, you know, and, countries that are not known for the champions of uh, to be the champions of human rights as, as we execute our own citizens like the u.s is number five or number six usually uh in countries uh with the highest executions so it's just uh sh you know uh means a lot to have international folks that are standing against uh the uh, this policy so yeah we'd be certainly up for kind of doing that as a day of fasting or putting that out and awesome Sweet. Man, I'm sad I'm so far away. Hard to get a hard to get a vegan cookie through the Skype machine. Yeah, I wish I could give you a cookie. It'd be, it'd be amazing. I guess what I wanted to ask you, I mean, I was just saying, uh, so I used to work for Speak, and then I, I decided I wanted to try and save up to buy some land and start like a little bit of food. So these days I'm work, I'm, I've become a classic middle class basket case. Yeah, these days all my time and energy just goes into working at this desk. And I wondered if you could offer any like words of support or advice for how to like keep the radical thing going, keep, keep the radical soul alive whilst at whilst all my energy goes into this work. So whether it, whether this is maybe just a stupid idea or not, I don't know. Yeah, well well first of all, thanks for all that you've 
put into the movement, you know, over the years. And, and uh, it sounds like a great new vision you have. There's, there, I mean, there's so many wonderful communities that sound similar to what you might be doing, you know, that have land and Koinonia Farm down in Georgia and Little Flower Catholic Worker in Virginia. And, uh, you know, so many, we've got some really beautiful um, rural communities. And that, that was the idea of the Catholic Workers, you know, too, was to have urban rural partnerships where, um, the best of the city could meet the best of the country and, you know, we could sort of build the new Jerusalem. So that's a, it's a great vision. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a, you know, a, 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 a like anecdote or anything. I, I, I do know that what I found to be so, so important is that just like we hear, um, you know, many hands make for light work, um, many wallets make, expenses cheaper you know so i think the more that people can um buy into the idea and pull money together the more uh the easier it is for you not to carry the full burden of that i mean we never could have started our community without uh there were well we originally had like 30 people that said we're in you know we're gonna do this a great idea and they were like all right so here's the basket. Put your credit cards and money in. then we had six you know <laughs> but it was those six that came up with five thousand dollars and that's what we had to have you know to start our community and um then we pulled our money together every month and just built momentum you know and and 20 years in now we've got you know a lot of resources but it's been you know it's it's been that idea of kind of the multiplication that happens um through community so i just you know encourage you um uh, to build that, you know, with other folks that might want to get on board so that you, you don't have the full burden and responsibility of um, saving up just your own money, you know, because I, I think we're with all of these things, we're working against muscle. We're working with muscles that have atrophied, you know, like we're still we, we've made such idols out of individualism and independence that it's hard to um, build things communally. And so I, I think we're all, you know, there's a lot of a lot of. Uh, um, uh, work to kind of start to, to, to use those muscles again and figure out how some folks could get on board so that you don't, you don't have to do that all on your own, you know. And we've even got a group here that has a lot of uh, debt uh, from college, and there's a group of folks that have gotten together in order, and they're really smart, uh, but it, they, they've gotten together to pull money together, um, and they make a 10-year commitment um, and they get the person with the highest interest out of debt first. And then they've got this chart that they can say, if all ten, you know, if all of us were paying off our own debt, it would take us collectively like a hundred years. But if we do this together, we can do it in 10 years, but it's going to take everybody, you know, pulling it together. So I think we've got, we've got to have as much collaborative imagination as the corporate machines and the credit card companies have to get us in the funk that we get in to begin with. So I think we've really got to build alternative uh, ways of money sharing and debt sharing and, um, and land owning and tool sharing and all that stuff to build collectives for the common good. So yeah, keep going though. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got we've got a website too that I think it's uh still current. We might need to give it a little update, but we had like 120 different communities or something around the states and also some in the UK um that are are living, you know, in community and stuff in different forms and um but uh it was just the community of communities. There's a website. That's cool. So it's about 100 yeah. Yeah. And some of them have been a long, I mean, we've been around 20 years, but some of them have been around a lot longer than that, you know, so it's cool to have kind of grandmother and grandfather communities and, you know, some of the younger ones together to see like, you know, to share ideas and there's kind of a fresh fire in some of the young communities, but there's also a sense that some of the communities, they don't have the roots and they're like, that's, it says it falls and it's beautiful, but it doesn't last long, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Of a community, of pulling it together when 
everybody's so busy with jobs, say if you've got a group of people that are really, really busy with jobs in a local town or, or city, how do you help them find enough time to kind of pull the beginnings of it together? Or what are the advice in the early stages? Yeah, a couple of things I would say that I've, I've seen, you know, important for us and also other communities are, well, one of them is to figure out who the, um, um, what it means to be in and who is in, you know, like who's putting their hand in the middle. So um, for us, like we talked about the essentials um, and that meant what are the beliefs that are important to us and what are the practices that are important to us. And those are on our website, you know, but they're based, the beliefs are very orthodox, you know, traditional Christian beliefs. And then the, the, the practices are things like nonviolence and simple living, uh, racial justice and reconciliation, care for the environment and creation. And so we name all of those things. And that helps to say, like, these are the things we're building our community around. And then we also had, like, some eventually you came up with kind of house rules, you know, like, so we don't have people sleeping together that aren't married. We don't have people smoking pot on the roof, you know, stuff like that. So like, I think, you know, you, eventually you got to have some kind of like house rules too. But, um, but the essentials, like the beliefs and practices, I found like it's good to have some hard conversations up front so that you have a foundation to build on. And then other people may, you know, they may be a little bit more like, um, curious or you know that they, they, they might dip their feet on in into it but they're not ready to jump in and that's why we've said like building a community looks kind of like an onion you know it's got different layers within it so it's helpful for people to say we're the partners you know we're the kind of key stockholders or, or not or stakeholders not stockholders but stake you know we're, we're the whatever language you give to it we're the covenant members um and then you have volunteers that may not be christian they may you know We've got folks that volunteer that are in the military, so they're curious about nonviolence, but they're not committed to it necessarily. But I think it's helpful to have those articulated. Um, and then with the jobs thing, Louise, I, I mean, I think one of the things we had to say was like, we've got to figure out how people, there, there's not freeloaders, but everybody has a way to kind of contribute to the community. So for some people that feel called and compelled to work full time, then one of the ways that they contribute is financially. There's other folks that we really value what they do, like urban farmers and urban gardeners. Their, their job doesn't generate money, so we subsidize their living expenses so they can live um, and do their work that doesn't pay money. Um, and uh, so, but I think those things, you know, it's just figuring out how the pieces of the puzzle work together and that people actually are, are freed up to do what they love and what they, their vocation, what they feel called to do. And no one's, um, you know, just sucked into a, a job that doesn't give them life and that they don't want to be in. So we, we've tried to figure out, you know, how do we help people find their vocations and not just a job that pays the bills and how do we you know, pull our energies together um, and have like, sometimes I think it's really helpful to have a few things that we do well, especially if people are very busy. So like right now, our schedules are so sporadic that we don't, we weren't able to come up with a time that we do morning prayer. So we're doing evening prayer. Um, and we also do only one meal a week right now because that's what we could sustain. But it's, it's good to have things that you're like, man, I want more of that rather than have everybody kind of like coming to 10 meals a week and everybody's tired and, you know, just kind of uh, no one really wants to do the dishes. So I think it's kind of like we, we got to build it slowly like a, you know, a baby tree. Um, and then the roots get stronger and we can, you know, do, do some, we're freer to do some other things around it. But uh, yeah. So, and, you know, I'd love to keep talking with folks that are um, interested uh, uh, in community. There's some great communities that are out there. You can, um, find uh um especially jonathan wilson hartgrove who's down in uh at rootba house uh they've had gatherings like quarterly um around the states where people can talk about how to live in community and they do that on site at a community so you can kind of see how they live um but uh yeah well this is great and we'll keep in touch about stuff in june and other things but 
um, know that we're cheering you all on and we, we just think the world of you and speak. And um, I think it, this is the moment uh, um, for us to, to shine bright, you know, amidst all the chaos that's out there. So uh, uh, thanks for letting me share and uh, I'll continue to think of you as you, you gather and meet today over there. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. Thank you for going on the okay. We'll talk soon. Blessings.